Well, hi, everyone, and good afternoon. So first, I just want everybody to hear from you, and I would love if you could kind of give us a little background um, about yourself as a founder as well as your brand. I thought about the times in my life when I was most happiest, and one of those times was the times that I spent growing up um, with my mom. My mom was a chemist and a physician, and we used to make a lot of our own beauty products um, at home using ingredients that we would source from the health food store. And I thought this was the perfect time for me to actually take that kind of childhood legacy and actually turn it into something bigger, which ultimately became the catalyst for me um, jumping ship at Goldman Sachs to start Briogeo. So I met my co-founder in business school. One night we got into a conversation about life hacks, which inevitably led to a conversation about beauty hacks, because that's what you do with your girlfriends. Um, and I said something like, I've been trying to find the perfect new lipstick for like three years. We realized, you know, we were two women who were beauty enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. um, we had the disposable income to spend on it, but we felt left out of this global billion dollar industry, right? And like, how could this be so? From that mint, it was born. And our kitchen sink story with minted is that's kind of how we got our first uh, product. When we talked to manufacturers, they had no idea what we were talking about or what we were trying to pursue. So we actually went on YouTube, learned how to make lipstick, went on Google, bought all the ingredients and was cooking lipstick in our Harlem apartment. I love that you kind of have that, that, that kitchen story. I feel like as like a, a black woman and a woman of color, that is something that we really grew up like seeing like our moms and our grandmoms, like there's so much heritage and tradition and like in ingredients. Me starting the lip bar in my kitchen, it wasn't because I wanted to, it was because that was my only option. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that the lip bar has been able to double year over year since we started in our business. But at the end of the day, it would have been so much easier if I would have had the resources from day one to make the impact I wanted to see in my community. Diada, I would love yeah. just to, for us to kind of hear from you now. I would love for you to bring the skincare perspective and kind of talk us through. You haven't launched yet, but, but, yeah. but, but, but we're almost yeah. there. So talk yeah. us through kind of like why you felt like this was important. I wanted Black women specifically to want to see themselves. I, I, I realized um, along the years, wearing less makeup, you know, really focusing on skincare made me feel more confident. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to look into the mirror and not have to transform to walk outside the house to feel beautiful. I'm not having to um, kind of compromise on the packaging, the experience, the, the, the ingredients. So all of that we kind of thought through. Um, and hopefully you'll present this as like a love note to all the women that we, we thought about when we made it. Something else that I've, I've been thinking about, um, even in, I would say in this, I would beg to say in the skincare space, there's not a ton of black founders or I would say women of color founders in that industry. Did it feel isolating when you were first get when you were first preparing for launch or when you, you know, your first year of business, did you feel like you had to make um, explanations or kind of get people to understand why you need to exist in your particular space? So I would just love to hear kind of what that process and that journey was for you in the beginning. At the time, and it's crazy because this was only maybe eight years ago, but as a female going to these different pitch sessions, I was one of the few women there. I was certainly only the person pitching beauty. And I just felt like investors didn't understand my product. I agree with Nancy. It's definitely investors um, who didn't understand what we were doing in the beginning. If we were talking about new lipsticks for women of color and all of them, mainly being white men, would say, but my wife, my girlfriend has no problem finding a lipstick, uh, whether she goes to a retailer or a drugstore. And it's like, great. I'm glad she doesn't have an issue, but what about the rest of the world? It's been interesting to hear investors think that, well, this person exists, why should you exist? And it's, it's, a, it's a damaging narrative because it does not work that way. So it took a lot of listening, a lot of convincing. I had to, you know, sometimes dumb it down a bit. I'm like, if you go into the bread aisle, how many versions of bread do you see there? <laughs> somebody wants gluten-free, somebody wants toast, somebody wants a baguette. And it's a matter of, again, providing those solutions where that customer is. I love that. And let's keep it all the way real. Like women of color, black women, especially they spend in beauty and it has nothing to do with like what their actual like income levels are. Right. Like we know that black women, especially spend enormous amounts of money on beauty products. And so when you're talking about like the need for you to exist, it's like you're existing because there, there's a market for it and there's a consumer that's going to be willing to spend for products that work for her.
And I think um, you give us a really good transition. So we're going to move from kind of like the, the fruition and the past and focus a little bit more on the kind of like the last year up until now. Um, so last year, the Black Lives Matter movement really sparked a pivotal moment in history. And it impacted many, many industries, forcing brands to get political for pretty basically kind of like the first time. Um, how do you personally feel this movement impacted the beauty industry specifically? I think the first thing that comes to mind is just accountability. I think especially for us that we love the industry so much and a lot of us have been a part of it and willing to be to show up and be a part of that fabric and kind of make this quilt for the customer. But I think at that time we had to sit back and reevaluate like if we keep going at this pace, we're not we're doing everyone a disservice because not only are you know, are we diverse, but the generation to come after us is going to be the majority. <laughs> so the idea of minority is not even a thing anymore. It's a lot of us coming together and realizing that multicultural is the new wave. So um, even if you're talking P&L and bottom line, like that will actually benefit you. So how do we uh, change this narrative now uh, versus waiting until it's too late? I think to the ones that have been authentic, um, I think there have been several retailers who took the 15% pledge and we are in real time seeing that. We are seeing the shelves diversify in real time all across the store. Um, and I think that's that kind of beacon of hope we should all hold on to because again, I fundamentally believe more choice is always going to be better for the end consumer and for the industry, um, no matter what the founder looks like. But obviously, hooray if it's a black founder because we need those different voices. So I do think there's been some authentic change. But I also think indie brands have been the ones pushing the diversity, inclusion, authenticity more than anybody else. Um, because we have the agility and the authentic voice based on our founder stories to decide we want to participate or be as political or apolitical as we want to be. For me and at the Lip Bar, we've always picked a side. You know, we've never been afraid to say this is who we are and this is who we're supporting and this is what we believe. Um, and you're right, I think for the first time, lots of companies were faced with having to make a choice or, you know, potentially losing a customer. And I'm actually really happy that it all happened. I'm happy that it happened because for the first time ever, people understood that it's more than money. We have this whole new kind of consumer consciousness where people aren't just looking to brands to be cruelty free and to be, you know, to not, you know, be made with any toxic ingredients, you know, and to be organic. They're looking to see what are those, what is that brand's value? Where did they show up and how did they show up in the moments that were really important to me or to the people that I, that I care about? And I've appreciated the fact that that accountability exists a lot more now than it ever did. So we just kind of went through a really, um, you know, horrific wave of what's going on in the Asian American community with all like the, the you know, the violence and the attacks. And so, um, you know, we're seeing lots of brands kind of start to step in and support the Asian community as well. I'd love to hear how you also look, look, at, look at that as a whole and how you view allyship out, outside, of, um, outside of maybe your core consumer base. Just do what's on your heart. You know, do what's do what's top of mind. It's it's completely up to you. It's in your will wheelhouse. And just know that all help matters. Literally, like there's nothing that's too small or nothing that's too large. You just have to show up. I think for you know us, it's really about human rights. And that really expands everyone. It's something that I think, you know, all brands really need to think about because I think you know, during the off onset of BLM, a lot of brands didn't have that diversity value instilled within their company. And for so many, there was this scramble to figure out, okay, well, what do we do and how do we respond? Do we respond to this? Because it wasn't actually rooted in, in their DNA. And I think that brands that are really thinking about this more intentionally need to think about this from a human rights perspective and really need to be inclusive more broadly. What you saw in the responses to um, the Asian wave is that brands pay a lot of lip service, but they don't actually have the power to back it up. I think the thing that 
it feels difficult to be an ally when you don't have the right people in the room. But if you have the right people in the room and you've forever been an ally, then it's easy to quickly um, elevate a different voice or address something that's happening in real time. So going from now, we're going to pivot a little bit into the future of the industry and kind of what's next. What does the ideal future of the beauty industry look like to you? What more do you want to see? What more do you need need to see from the industry at large? From, from the beauty industry, I think my big, hairy, scary goal is that one day we're in the position to not necessarily have to talk about black beauty or brown beauty that it's just the standard of beauty it reminds me of you know the ethnic hair care aisle it's like at the end of the day i don't think of my hair as ethnic it's just my hair i don't think about you know black beauty i just think about the fact that i want to wake up and look like my best self and i want to have the offerings that will work for my skin tone i don't necessarily want to have to be relegated into a particular part of the beauty aisle or a particular part of of the beauty counter in order to be seen i think that you know being a black woman in beauty means that we are breaking the barriers that say black beauty is beauty. Just what I talked about earlier, just equity. I think we've had, we, we've identified the problem, but we're lo really looking for a solutions that are not um, short-sighted and more long-term um, for the generations to come. You know, if retailers, if uh, investors were really open to creating this world of ultimate choice, um, then you need to have founders creating and generating all of that innovation. And I think if we just put customers first and allow for the funnel of innovation, we'd be surprised at how, how inclusive and equitable and diverse it all truly becomes. Mm -hmm. Because someone has to power that innovation for all different types of people. And there's no one person or one type of person that could do that. Um, and so to me, it's the ultimate humanity meets business opportunity. If we really just change the way we thought about who is at the center of the customer experience. Amanda, you said that business opportunity. so brilliantly. That. I know, Amanda, you said that so, so brilliantly. And that's absolutely correct because if you look at the heritage of beauty for so many years from the beginning, it was all about the beauty brand defining what beauty is. Mm -hmm the beauty brand telling the consumer what they need, what the options are. And it's starting to reverse, but it needs to reverse more. Well, I cannot thank you all enough for joining us for YouTube's first Beauty Fest. I feel like I've learned so much from listening to you all. I'm incredibly inspired and you all have dropped a load of gems this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Derek Blasberg. I'm the head of fashion and beauty here at YouTube. And if you like that exclusive clip you just saw from hashtag beauty fest, click here to see even more of your favorite beauty creators, founders, gurus, hairstylists, makeup artists, pop stars. We've all got them right here at hashtag beauty fest.